I started origami when I was eight, around eight years old. Um, I had an uncle who gave me my first origami book. I only met him once in my life, and that was when he gave me an origami book. He did origami. I thought it was very interesting, and as soon as I started folding things up on my own, I was hooked, loved it. Um, sometime around, around 10, 12, I thought of opening up my origami models and looking at the crease patterns that they made, and I distinctly remember thinking, there's math here. I did not know what it was. I, I, it looked kind of scary to me, but I already knew I liked math, and I thought it was exciting. I, I, I remember thinking, there's got to be some geometry rules at play in this crease pattern that makes it fold into whatever it is. And that's what started me thinking, hey, maybe I can do math and origami at the same time. But I didn't really do that until I was in college and graduate school studying mathematics. Um, and uh, since, since then, and since becoming a professor, now I am a, a, a professor of mathematics. I teach college, university level math in the United States. I, uh, um, now, my sole area of research is studying the mathematics of origami. Um, you can pick almost any mathematical subject and find some way of exploring origami with it or using origami to demonstrate something in that mathematical subject. So to that end, one of the goals I had when, when writing my book, Project Origami, was just collecting activities for a, you know, a variety of mathematics classes so that anyone who's a math teacher could uh, pick, you know, look up what topic they're teaching and say, hey, here's an origami activity I can do in that class. And it's just amazing how pervasive origami is throughout all of math, whether it's number theory, algebra, calculus, geometry, combinatorics, topology, and even really hard things like differential geometry and, and stuff. There's, there's ways in which origami acti factors in. It's, it, it's enough to make me religious about math and origami. Yeah. A lot of people think math is about equations and, and numbers, and that's true, but those are just parts of math. What math really is about is studying patterns in anything and explaining them, making theorems about them, and proving them. Um, what, and they might be patterns about numbers or equations, but they might also be patterns about uh, colors, tilings, um, things in, that you find in nature, or the crease lines in an origami model. So in terms of studying patterns, origami is a medium that allows you to do that. And sometimes there's this perfect intersection between the things we want to teach in math, say in a subject like algebra, and what we see happening in origami. And you can just bring the two together, and students love to fold, it makes them excited, and it usually works. My book, Project Origami, does uh, um, exactly try to uh, take what I've found, both in terms of collecting origami math stuff, um, but also what I've found to be successful in, in the classes I've taught, whether they're a calculus class, or an algebra class, or geometry, or, or, or whatever, and package those lesson plans, those things, so that other teachers can use them. It, my, my purpose in the book was really just to spread this information around. Because while a lot of people have written about origami and math, they're on these articles that are very hard to find and, and, and they span decades and they're just little bits here and there and there's a lot of people reinventing the wheel. But I, I just wanted to try to collect a lot of it in one place because I, knew there, I know there are teachers out there, both college, university teachers and primary, secondary school teachers who wants that information so that they can do this too. So I was really trying to do a service um, to the community and, and just bring this together. But it's also just grown. Um, uh, once I wrote that book, lots of people sent me ideas and or told me how things worked when they tried using the, thing, the, the topics. So, so, um, so I've been working on a second edition of the book because there's now more material since the book has been out there. For, Froebel was probably, as far as we know, the first person to try to use paper folding um, to teach things like symmetry and, and you know, basic geometric concepts. Um, and yeah, there hasn't been, at least in the United States, there hasn't been um, really an organized effort to get origami into the national mathematics curriculum. But there are enough teachers out there um, who see the potential and who study origami that there's certainly people who are active in the national math education scene in the United States to, so that Regularly at math education conferences, you see workshops on origami. You see people writing articles about, hey, here, here's something you could do with your classes. Um, and, you know, and, and there's my book that's out there now, as well as other books that try to ex explore 
like, like there's a book that targets just modular origami. How can you use modular origami in high school or middle school math classrooms? So it's definitely growing. Um, I would love to see it become, origami become an official part of, of curricula um, at various schools, but uh, um, I don't think we're quite there yet, but maybe. You know. So origami models like these do have a purely aesthetic appeal. Um, I know I, some of my students just love to fold them because they're pretty, but, uh, but each and every, I think every origami model that I fold, and I, I would actually conjecture every origami model period does have latent mathematics in it that you cannot escape from. And you may not be conscious of it, but it's there. Some of these models, like, well, let's just say, like this one, um, the mathematics is more explicit. Uh, there's a couple of things going on here. This is just a, um, this is something we call a torus, or a donut, as they sometimes say in the United States. Um, but, it, but, but it's a tubular ring, and it's made out of uh, one of my units, the, the Fizz unit. And it's something of an advanced modular origami project, um, because it takes, uh, let's see, this one takes 81 little pieces of paper to make, and so, so that's you know, more than 30, <laughs> which is a kind of a standard uh, number you see. Um, but one thing going on here is that I, in or, when making this, I wanted to make sure that at each corner, at each vertex, I had all three colors. I didn't want any two pieces of paper of the same color to be touching. So making that work, especially on a structure like a torus, which is topologically very different than something like this, which is like a sphere or a regular polyhedron. I mean, here I also have no two pieces of paper of the same color touching. But since it's spherical, that's a little bit easier to do than this, which is a torus. So that gets into the mathematics of surfaces. Like what's the difference between the surface of a, a donut and the surface of a sphere? Um, and then getting the units to actually make such a surface. You know, uh, this, this one, uh, the, the units form these pentagonal rings. And you can glue pentagons together to make something spherical and get, and because that's the, the geometric object of a dodecahedron. Um, but if you want to make a torus, you can't just use pentagons. I have pentagons here, but you also have to use hexagons. And inside the ring where all the action's happening, there are actual octagons. And you have to know how to piece those things together. And again, that, that enters the realm of um, combinatorial topology. It's, it's, it, it's a rather advanced math going on here, but it's definitely stuff I can teach my undergraduate uh, university students. Um, and if they can fold something like this, not only are they good origamists, but they actually know the math. They, they, they must have learned something in order to achieve this. So I, I find there's a lot of educational potential behind things like this. Even though you're making something pretty that maybe you just want to hang from your dorm room, you know? Well, in any mathematics that's present in one of these models, um, there's lots of questions you can ask. And one of them is, yes, if you can do this, which this type of coloring is called a proper three edge coloring. I'm coloring the edges of this, this structure so that no two uh, uh, pieces of paper of the same color touch. Um, and as soon as you start asking questions about the patterns of those colors or, you know, um, you know, how are they arranged? Is, is there some structure to it? You very quickly get into areas of math where no one knows the answer. Um, these are active areas of research that that fits right into a type, a, a branch of math called topological graph theory. And there's a lot we don't know about how the colors are arranged or when we can always color these things and when we can't. Um, I have colleagues who are, who are asking those questions, and not, not in terms of origami, but in terms of pure math. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of open questions, things that we just don't know the answer to yet. Uh, so, um, so when it comes to the arrangements of the colors and can we capture that, cap capture the pattern or the symmetry of them, sometimes we can under certain circumstances, but we don't know everything yet. And any time I can get my students to see the cutting edge right at the area of research where we don't know the answers to all the math questions, I feel like I've really done something. Because too many students think math is done and has been done for thousands of years, you know, but, but stuff like this gets right at, right at the edge. It's kind of exciting.